Hi, I'm James Dacey, a reporter for Physics World magazine. I'm here at St George's Concert Hall in Bristol, which tonight is playing host to a special performance and lecture about the legacy of Albert Einstein, the scientist, the man and the musician. Particle physicist Brian Foster has teamed up with the British musician Jack Liebeck to create the show which they call Einstein's Universe. I was lucky enough to catch up with the pair earlier to find out a little bit more about this interesting fusion of science communication and classical music. Music played a very important part in Einstein's life. It was central to his enjoyment of life. He often said that he'd had more pleasure in his life from playing the violin than from anything else he did. So it was certainly a central part to, uh, away from science, a central part to how he, how he lived his life and how, how he enjoyed his life. Um, it was not such an important influence on the way he did science. We have indications from his wife in a letter that he often would come out of his study when they lived in Berlin um, and, and scratch his head, play a few chords on the piano, think a bit more, then go back into his study and write down some new ideas he'd had. It often is the case in science that when one thinks deeply about something, a break, doing something different like playing an instrument can somehow crystallise one's thoughts into a new direction and that certainly was an important part of the way that Einstein thought about physics. There are conflicting reports on, on how good Einstein was at playing the violin. Um, he uh, used his fame, he was arguably with people like Charlie Chaplin, the most famous person in the world uh, in the 30s and 40s. Um, and he used that fame to uh, become acquainted and friends with many of the great musicians of his day. So he was a great friend of Fritz Kreisler, the violinist, of Piotr Gorski, the cellist. And they played chamber music often together. Reports from people like that, the great musicians of, of the day, were that Einstein was a competent violinist, um, you know, but nothing particularly special, nothing particularly good. Um, and of course, they would think that. I, I think that the, the famous story that one of them, Piatigorsky, said that Einstein couldn't count is, is almost certainly not correct, but it's such a good story that people would make it up if it wasn't true. Um, but I think it's also true that Einstein was a very good, competent violinist in his youth. I think. Um, it's clear that he could play on uh, the stage in front of an audience with professional musicians and not make a fool of himself, be accepted as a member of a, of a string quartet. Einstein's work in theoretical physics was very much uh, an attempt to unify physics, uh, to, to try to explain disparate, apparently disparate elements uh, in a single unified framework. And he often said that that framework should be extremely beautiful. So I think what's important is to realise that Einstein's example of looking for beautiful theories uh, is one which is still going on today. So that the, the work which is going on at LHC to try to find the um, possible unified way of looking at forces is one which very much follows the pattern which Einstein set, one of unification uh, and one of beauty. So what we're trying to do is to unify, for example, the forces of gravity with the other forces, which we understand very well in the standard model of particle physics. And that is one of the main aims of the LHC. So I think Einstein's general method of approaching physics, to look for beautiful solutions, to look for a minimum number of assumptions to produce a bigger assimilation, a bigger unification of apparently disparate elements of physics is very much the driving force behind all the theoretical physics since, since his death.
So this is quite an interesting collaboration here, particle physicist, musician. Can you tell me how it came about? So I heard Jack play first in the Cheltenham Festival in 2003, I think it was, and um, I was very impressed by his playing. And then I went to another concert of his and we got chatting after the, after the concert and we realised we had lots of common interests and we quickly became friends. He came to, to Oxford and had dinner at Balliol College. And um, then he started to, to give me lessons. Um, and then we started to think about 2005, which was World Year of Physics. Yeah, we, well, we um, met up just for a drink after a concert, actually. Um, and uh, Brian told me that he was involved in a series of lectures that he had to come up with because it was World Year of Physics and, um, you know, was trying to think of a nice project to, to put together. And I'd sort of reminded him a little earlier that Einstein was a violinist. Um, I'd, I remember seeing a film when I was a kid of Einstein playing the violin or something, or a movie of him, uh, um, uh, not a real movie of him playing, but a sort of a, a fictional movie of him playing. And um, sort of that sort of it was a light bulb moment, and we decided that it would be a really good thing to try and link music and physics through using the Einstein interest in music. So um, it was a sort of a eureka moment, really. <laughs> yes, coin of phrase. And why do you think this format works so well? Well, I think, um, well, from, uh, I remember certainly when I was at school that it's a really good idea to keep things interesting in, in class and in lectures, for, for instance. Um, and so the idea of, of ha mixing disciplines is a way to keep an audience going. I mean, because if you just had, you know, sort of science being uh, talked at you for an hour and a half, I think quite quickly the eyes droop and people sort of go into their own little world. So that our lecture sort of, it's quite fast paced and it, it keeps on changing direction. Uh, there's music, there's a bit of humour, we hope, uh, there's all sorts of, uh, and the science and then, you know, we, we mix it up and there's demonstrations. So there's never a time when people kind of just go, oh God, this is getting a bit uh, tiresome, I think. I think that's why the format really works. Perhaps just a bit more about this, uh, this fusion of, of science and music. I mean, question for Jack, I mean, do you think maybe there's a deeper link between science and music? I mean, for example, your understanding of musical form, does that help you in any way to get your head around the physics that Brian talks about in the lecture? I'm not sure about that. I mean, the, the, we're not, we don't at any point go and say that there is going to be some kind of link between physics and, and music in that way. It's more in a sort of, they complement each other as disciplines. Um, it's very true that a lot of you know, physicists and generally scientists and mathematicians love playing music. And I think that the, I, it's difficult to put your finger on why, what the exact link is, but I, I, I should think that there is some kind of a link in the discipline of, you know, reading a code on a page put, and it, it turning into music. Uh, and in the day-to-day -day life of trying to work out what's going on in their particular discipline through looking at the codes that come out and deciphering how things, uh, things are put together. And, and so I feel that there's probably a link in that way. Um, and also it's a, you know, yeah. with music, not only is it code reading and everything, but there's emotion involved as well. Um, so it's, it's got that added thing on top of it as well. So here, Byron, you're not a bad musician yourself and uh, occasionally you play duets with Jack. Could you maybe give us a quick demonstration here? Yes, if you uh, have no children watching. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to play um, an arrangement of Violin Sonata by Mozart in C major, K296. Thank you. 